Yo, what's going on guys? Welcome back to Baloney Basketball. I know it's been a while, but I'm here with Johnny. Uh, how's it going, Johnny? Yeah, going great, Garrett. Uh, obviously has been quite a bit. Um, but we want to have some flow with our shows, but we don't want to necessarily break up all the different rounds of the playoffs. So we're coming back to recap both the conference finals and then give a preview of the finals, which will be starting on Wednesday. Yeah, and I mean, we're going to get into the first thing here. Before we get into the finals and the conference finals recap, we got news about a few teams that are already eliminated. First one being the Indiana Pacers. Uh, apparently, according to Jared Weiss, he has reported that Victor Oladipo is ready to move on. And there's also speculation that Miles Turner could be in the same boat. So potentially both those guys could be gone. Um, some of the teams that were listed that could be interested are the Lakers, Knicks, Mavericks, Suns, Raptors, Nets, and Timberwolves for Victor Oladipo's services. But uh, what do you think? Do you think any of those teams could land him? And what about Miles Turner? Yeah, ask, if you asked me a year ago, um, I for sure would have said that um, Oladipo on the Heat probably would have been a very intriguing fit. But given where we are today, um, I'm not sure the Heat want to break up what they have in order to add Oladipo. Um, given his recent injury history um, and just how he's kind of recovered from it, he's not somebody that I want to mortgage my future for. Um, so if he wants out, it's not that there's going. It's not that there's not going to be be people that want him or teams that want him. Um, but I think some of these teams that are already in contention mode um, shouldn't necessarily ditch what they're building to try and get a step ahead with Oladipo. Um, with Miles Turner, I think the fit is pretty clear. There's two teams um, that I see could use him, um, those being the Rockets and the Celtics, especially for the Rockets. Uh, small ball, I don't think that it failed. I just think that they ran into a better team. But I think having a rim protector in there that can also shoot threes is good. And then the Celtics, Daniel Tice is good, but um, they need somebody for when he's not on the court. Uh, so I think Turner would be that guy. And then even the third the third team that I think would be intriguing would be the Pelicans. Um, I see Zion as a four, so I think they still need to find that five beside him. Uh, Hayes is certainly developing to be that guy, and Derek Favors is, is starting to, to leave that role. So I think a guy like Miles Turner would be great there. Yeah, the Pelicans is a good one for Miles Turner, but I think the Celtics would be the best fit. I was just talking with someone on – Twitter the other day because there was this rumor about how the Celtics could trade Gordon Hayward for Victor Oladipo uh, and I'm like I don't know how much sense that makes but it would make more sense if they got Miles Turner because Daniel Tice I mean sometimes he was even getting exposed by Bam guarding the perimeter so and I think Miles Turner could help with that and also his floor spacing but I mean looking at Victor Oladipo I'm looking at some of these teams listed here and a lot of them are already like contenders or they're trending in the right direction like the Lakers are playing in the finals right now um, you know, so are the Heat. The Mavericks are one of the top young teams. The Suns, I mean, they just went 8-0 in the bubble. But, I mean, an interesting one could be the Raptors, maybe. I know there's been all this talk about how they could, um, you know, try and reunite with DeMar DeRozan in the offseason. But what about Victor Oladipo? I mean, they're kind of similar players. I know Victor Oladipo is a bit of a better shooter. But I think that's a massive... Um, addition if they can get him now I don't know what they'd have to give up maybe Norman Powell would have to be gone which could hurt them too but ultimately I think if Victor Oladipo is back 100% I've said this multiple times I think that well not only is he the best player on the Pacers easily right now but I think he's a top 15 player in the league and a top three shooting guard behind Harden and Clay. and in some ways he does stuff better than Clay. so I mean, I think a lot of people are forgetting how great he was two years ago when he was fully healthy. Yeah, I, I, a year ago, as I said, I'm on that train, but um, he just hasn't been the same. And I know he probably was rushed back from injury this year in the postseason, uh, didn't necessarily have time to get his feet under him. Um, but I'm just not so sure that I want my team to to go out after him. Now, if he could be had for a discount, then that's a different question. Um but, I mean, like I said, there's not a shortage of teams that are going to be after him. It's just a matter of um, which deal Indiana likes the best. Because uh, I've, I've been seeing a lot of people, you know, the Heat always were last year. The team, oh, the Depot's going to go to the Heat. Um, but now if you're a Heat fan, you don't want to get rid of Tyler Hero. So um, 
things change, and that's certainly what's happened with Oladipo. I do believe that he'll be gone after saying what he what he said, um, but I'm very intrigued to see what uh, the Pacers can get in return. Yeah, I was just pulling up uh, the first round series. I know he struggled to start against Miami, but I know that the past few games or the last few games in that series, although they did get swept, he played pretty solid. But I don't know. I think if he comes back 100, percent it's definitely a good addition for any team. But I think we're gonna progress here to another team that I guess fell short of their own expectations. And that's the LA Clippers. A uh, big Woj bomb the other day. Uh, Doc Rivers is out as the head coach. He is fired, and they're looking at guys like Tyron Liu, um to potentially replace him. So what do you make of the Doc Rivers firing? Um, shocking, uh, but I'm not so sure it's necessarily the wrong move. Um, Doc has had so much talent, uh, Going back to uh, uh, Clipper or sorry, not his Clippers days, his Celtics days as well, um, and only managed to squeeze out one title. Um, titles are hard to come by, so it's not it's not like it's a huge disappointment. But you'd think that with with the Lob City Clippers and all the talent he had on the Celtics, that he'd be able to to win more than one title. They certainly fell short of expectations this year. Paul George coming out and saying that this wasn't the title or bust year. Um, I do not think that that was true. These players are, are on limited deals. They they don't have a huge future anymore, considering that every single first-round pick they own for the next, uh, whatever, five or six years are now in the hands of the Thunder. Um, they need to win now. That That's the whole mantra of this team. To be up 3-1 on the Nuggets is one thing. To blow, two, to blow three straight 10-plus leads in the third quarter is another thing. To have your two biggest stars not shine in the fourth quarter is another thing. I think more so that this is just a change of scenery. Um, not necessarily that Doc is a bad coach, but um, you see it in baseball all the time. You see it in, in basketball as well, where sometimes teams are just on that brink of uh, taking that next step. You, we saw it with the Warriors here with Mark Jackson uh, to, to, to Steve Kerr, where Mark Jackson... He was a good coach, but he just couldn't get him over the hump, and maybe this is the same thing. But to me, Tyron Luce should be the next coach of the Clippers. Yeah, I think a 3-1 lead is like the new mantra kind of the NBA. Like, when people started saying the thing where Doc Rivers, he's the only coach to blow uh, multiple 3-1 leads, let alone, I mean, he's done it three times, not just two. Uh, I think that everyone, like, started looking at, like, well, this guy, you know, is he even the coach? Is he even going to be a great coach? Yeah, he won with the Celtics, but he had three, arguably four Hall of Famers if Rondo gets in. So I kind of was not too surprised, but I guess it kind of the news kind of died down about it for the past week. It was the talk for like two, three days after they got eliminated. Then it kind of died down, and then all of a sudden it's like he's gone. Um, and, I mean, the thing with Paul George, like you said, he has a history of saying stuff that's very questionable. Um, I mean, he even said it last year, like when they lost to the Blazers saying that's a bad shot, but it went in, um, you know, the playoff P uh, thing. And then he comes out and drops five points against the Jazz. Um, so if they want to win, well, they're going to have to get, first of all, a coach that has some experience in that level. Tyron Lue would pro probably be a good coach, but – I mean, they can't come in with the mindset that they're just above all. I think that's what Paul George, Patrick Beverly, um, Lou Williams, because he didn't even really take it serious once the bubble started. I think the only one that probably did was Kawhi. And unfortunately, Kawhi had a bad game in game seven, which was like the biggest game of their season, and then they lost. So I don't know. They're going to have to make some moves. It's going to be hard, like, gauging them next year. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is, as you said, because it's not like they lost to the Lakers in a seven in Game 7 or anything like that. They didn't even make the Western Conference Finals, um, which is utterly crazy. Um, everybody had them penciled into at least the Western Conference Finals. Um, and then Rivers, Doc Rivers, this is his third 3-1 blown lead, and I think there's only 12 or 13 in NBA history. So he accounts for 20% or so of them. Um, 
So he has that history. Uh, like I said, I don't think it necessarily means he's a bad coach. I think we just we've just seen him in the playoffs now not make the correct adjustments or the necessary adjustments, and it's cost his team numerous games. Um, and in this case, it didn't only cost them a game; it cost them a whole series. So uh, I do think that that this was the right move. However, I feel like if the Clippers were going to do it, it could have been something that could have been done the day after the three-one loss instead of or the day after the series was over instead of waiting uh, four or five days. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to make it seem like Doc Rivers is a bad coach. I think he's still like in the top half of all the current coaches in the league right now. But I mean, it maybe he just wasn't the right coach because it didn't seem like he was making that many adjustments in the series. Um, I mean, how many times did Jamal Murray and Jokic run a pick and pop and they just double teamed Jamal Murray every time and they left Jokic for a wide open three at the top of the key. And then you saw like what the Lakers did, they took that away. So all the speculation that the Clippers are supposed to have one of the best defenses in the league and they couldn't even communicate on that. They didn't have a scheme for it whatsoever. I mean, part of that falls on him. So, I mean, we'll see who they hire. We'll see what they do, but it's just a really weird situation. Yeah. Um, put it this way, a lot of teams that hired coaches this year already would have or are mad at themselves, uh, waiting that they would have held out a little to end up at least interviewing or have a chance for Doc Rivers. So he is a very good coach, yes. Right. And um, speaking of other coaches, um, specifically with our Bulls, uh, we just hired Billy Donovan as the head coach. Uh, to replace Jim Boylan. So what do you make of the Billy Donovan signing? Um, as a Bulls fan, I always tell people anything other than Jim Boylan <laughs> would have made me happy. Um, there's one name out there that I would have liked to see over Billy Donovan, and that's Kenny Atkinson. But outside of him, I w I'm very pleased with the Billy Donovan hiring. Um, now knowing that Doc Rivers was fired, uh, I certainly would not have been mad had they gone that route either. Um, but, I mean, here, the, the Thunder had a 0.1% chance to make the playoffs at the beginning of the year, secured the five seed, took the Rockets to seven games. Um, Billy Donovan clearly knows what he's doing, so I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see how he how he decides to, to go about this year and see if he can really extract some more value out of Levine or Lowry. Um, but the big guy on the Bulls I'm looking at this year is Wendell Carter, so I want to see how we can utilize him. Yeah, I think right now, like Billy Donovan, you can kind of label him in a similar category to Brad Stevens in the sense where, I mean, both these guys, they've had rosters that didn't have any expectations and they exceeded expectations. And then they've also had rosters that, you know, were supposed to, you know, make the jump, possibly championship contenders, and then ultimately fell short or disappointed at the end. But, I mean, if you look at the Bulls roster right now, we're not competing for a championship by any means. Uh Next year, we'll probably be somewhere between the 7 and the 10 seed. Uh, at least that's our expectation. You know, that was the Thunders coming into this year, and they got the 5th seed. So I guess you never know, but I think that this is a good move for the Bulls. Um, and like you said, anything besides Jim Boylan is a W. So I think that, I mean, it, it can't, like, it can't get any worse than it was. And And that's... That's kind of where I'm going with it, um, where you kind of use that comparative measure and you look at what you had versus what you have now when we just couldn't be happier as Bulls fans to, to not only be off of Boylan, but have a competent coach. Yeah, in our church, we trust. That's what they say on, on uh, Twitter. But we're going to move on to the conference finals recaps now. Uh, starting with the East, um, the Miami Heat beat the Celtics in six games. Uh First of all, what do you make of this Miami Heat run? And what do you think of the Celtics' end of the season? Yeah, the Heat run has been nothing short of incredible. Um, certainly didn't predict it. Uh, heck, I even thought that the, the Pacers' Heat series was probably going to be one of the best first-round series, and that turned out to be utterly wrong. Um, figured that the Heat won the first round, that they'd probably lose in five or six to the Bucks. Uh, instead, they beat the Bucks in five got to the Celtics and I beginning of the year I said the Celtics if the Bucks don't make the finals the Celtics are my team so I was like okay now the Celtics don't have to go through the Bucks um and Miami handled them uh Boston had many opportunities to win not not only those games but the series uh 
a lot of blown fourth quarter leads. Miami is probably the most well coached team in the NBA right now. Um, Jimmy Butler is obviously a great player. Bam's a great player, but it's not like you look at them and necessarily say that they're bona fide superstars. Um, whereas you go to the Celtics and you you probably think that Jason Tatum is a is a uh, he's going to be a superstar. He's a budding superstar. Jalen Brown probably won't be a superstar, but will be a caliber uh, an All Star caliber player. Um, and I think the Celtics had more talent, but I just think that Eric Spolstra can can throw so many different things at you defensively. We saw the two three zone utilized a lot, um, but it's not a traditional two three zone. He puts his two forwards at the top of it, so there's a lot of length. Um, interesting. I'll be interested to see if he does the same thing versus the um, the Lakers. But I just think that Spolstra was very unpredictable, and, and Goran Dragic played very well as the Tyler Hero. So. I think Boston, or I think, uh, sorry, Miami was just able to capitalize and really able to, to take advantage of everything. Yeah, I still think that between the two, I think Boston has more talent than Miami. But, um, I mean, a lot of stuff for the Celtics. Like, I mean, Marcus Smart's hot shooting in the first two rounds. It kind of died down a little bit that series. Um, you know, Jason Tatum a little bit passive to start some of those games. And, I mean, Kemba Walker, I think that, I, I was kind of disappointed the way he played. I mean, we've seen him in this stage in college, uh, you know, where he led his team to the national championship. And he's been in Charlotte for so long. And, you know, he's been waiting for that opportunity. But now he has that opportunity. And, I mean, he kind of didn't really perform that well. But I feel like a lot of people aren't talking that much about how he played. And this is probably, what, a top five, top six point guard in the league, or at least somewhere around there. Uh, so I think that that has to be accounted for. Um, as for the Heat, I mean, it, it is kind of a crazy run. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. You guys might have to uh, watch back our first episode, but we made predictions for the standings, and I don't know if either of us even had the Heat higher than, like, the seven seed or something. Maybe, like, six, but, I mean, that – and they did get the fifth seed in all, but that's still pretty amazing that they're even in the finals. I don't think there's ever been a – fifth seed exactly in the finals i know there's been six seeds and eight and an eight seed but um i mean yeah we're gonna have to see like they have so many weapons like obviously we know what jimmy butler is bam is an all-star tyler hero has been showing out Drogic, duncan robinson he can hit like five or six threes in any given night we saw iggy hit four threes the other day if iggy's hitting four threes i don't know who can beat this heat team honestly but uh that's just kind of my takeaway and the heat I mean, like you said, Eric Spolstra is probably one of the best coaches in the league. So they're definitely a scary team. Yeah, I did see that the Heat are the biggest underdog to make the finals um, in that at the beginning of the year they were um, 1 in 750, plus 750 um, to make the finals. So, so there's that. Um, but, yeah, as you said, I think – a lot of Boston's was just too little too late, thinking that their talent would ultimately override everything. But um, there's something to be said about a team playing together um, and not necessarily just relying on star power. Yeah, and I think that they do that pretty well. Kind of like the, you know, we saw the 4 Pistons. We've seen the, I know the Mavericks kind of had a star in Dirk, but he was getting up there in age too. But just, they have so many weapons that it's a scary team for sure. But they're going to be playing in the NBA Finals against the Los Angeles Lakers as they shut down the infamous 3-1 Nuggets. Uh, they ended them in Game 5. Uh, what do you think of this Lakers team, and what do you make of the Nuggets' remarkable yet disappointing end to a postseason? Yeah, I think that that five-game series was a lot closer than the scoreline suggests. Um it did not feel like the Lakers won it in five. It felt like a hard um, seven-game series. The one thing I don't – I hate to do it because I don't want to bring refs into the conversation, but I feel like game one, the second quarter, the refs just dominated it. Um, and you hate to see it because you don't want a Western Conference final storyline to be about the refs. But I did feel like there were a lot of questionable calls. Um, it's not that the refs – lost the Nuggets the series because the Lakers did play well but the Lakers got the benefit of the doubt on a lot of very 50-50 uh, calls um, which ultimately pushed them forward the Nuggets themselves I think the biggest beneficiary out of this bubble to me 
Jeremy Grant coming into free agency because he just secured himself 14 to 18 million a year without a doubt. Whether or not the Nuggets bring him back, that I don't know. Um, we saw a lot of flashes out of Michael Porter Jr. If he was just a competent defender, um, you, there's, you just can't get him off the court because he is so special offensively. Um, so you got that going for them. Gary Harris just didn't show up. They were missing Will Barton. There, so there were, you know, there were some issues there in that respect. Um, but I mean, J- Jamal Murray is is a star, and and I'll be, I'll admit I was wrong here because I always said, oh, he wasn't worth the money. Jamal Murray isn't that good. He proved me wrong a million times. Um, he looks spectacular all postseason. I, I do think that Jokic didn't have the best series. A um, couple of games he got into early foul trouble, couldn't get into a rhythm. Um, and then you had Mason Plumlee on the court, and unfortunately he just can't match any of that. Uh, I saw he was getting a lot of blame for that Anthony Davis winner. Um, I'm not so sure that that's necessarily fair. I don't know if you saw the video, but it looked like Jeremy Grant was saying, I'm going to need help on LeBron, and so there's a little miscommunication there. But that's what happens when you have a great player like LeBron standing there. Um, is that you can't just leave him. Uh, if that Danny Bean or, or Contavious Caldwell Pope, then it's a different story. But with LeBron James there, you got to pay attention. And I think it's just unfortunate for the Nuggets because that, that series could have gone so many different ways and, and none of them really bounced in their favor. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, the Nuggets, they had a crazy postseason. Obviously, no one picked them to beat the Clippers. And I think a lot of people counted them out, even when they were down 3-1 of the Jazz, even though... I think most people would probably think the Nuggets are the better team than Utah, especially when they didn't have uh, Bogdanovich. So I think that that's remarkable in itself. But, I mean, like you said with the Jeremy Grant thing, that's going to be interesting what they do with Paul Millsap because he is coming off, uh, I believe, the last year his deal. So is he going to take less money? Because he did have some pretty bad games in this Lakers series too. Uh, But, I mean, we'll see if he's willing to take that money or go somewhere else. And, I mean, he's kind of their, really their only veteran on the team. I know these other guys now are getting experience, but, I mean, we'll see what happens there. Uh, But, I mean, yeah, it was a close series. I think that the 4-1 doesn't really say it all. I mean, the game winner, if that would have just changed, then, I mean, it could have been a 2-1 series for the Nuggets at that point. Then we don't know what happens. As for the refs part, uh... I think maybe game four was probably one of the more uh, visible things with the refs playing a part in it, especially down the stretch of the game. But, I mean, yeah, the Lakers did play well. I mean, you can't discount the fact that, I mean, AD had like, I believe, 37 to one game and like 35 another, and LeBron had almost like a 40-point triple-double in the closeout. Uh, But, I mean, the Nuggets were right there. And like you said, they were missing some pieces. So... We'll see what happens, Um, but I guess I will say about the AD game winner, I think part of that is just Mike Malone's fault because it seemed like Mason Plumlee wanted Jokic to go switch onto AD, and Jokic was guarding the inbounder, and I don't understand in a situation like that, especially when the guy inbounding the ball is arguably a top 10 passer ever in Rajon Rondo. I don't know why you want... Jokic, who, I mean, he's not going to be able to get high up in the air. He can move his arms around all he wants. He's not going to be able to see where the ball's going to go, and he's not going to be able to get in the air because, I mean, well, he can't jump. So I don't know why you have him guarding the ball like that, especially when Rondo can stand so far behind the baseline that, I mean, he made an easy pass to AD and they won the game. And we saw that with uh, the OG and Anobi one with Taco Fall guarding it. Uh, guarding the inbound and he was so far behind the sideline that he could make that pass to Ananobi and they won the game so I don't really understand that in certain situations but I don't know maybe that's just me uh, but yeah the Lakers will move on and some of their role players like KCP uh, Alex Caruso played some good defense playoff Rondo is real and we'll see if they can win it all in the finals so yeah Michael Malone I think he had a a solid postseason um, in terms of his coaching and adjustments. But the end of game two, uh, when Anthony Davis did hit that buzzer beater, he was put in a little bit of a predicament, if you will, um, in that the Lakers had no timeouts. So Michael Malone didn't want to call a timeout to give the Lakers time to draw up a play. But by not calling a timeout, he also wasn't able to get the defense set. And so he opted not to call the timeout. And then we saw the little defensive breakdown, the blunder that ended up leading to the Anthony Davis three. Um, 
But outside of that, I do think he played well, or I do think he coached well. And then as for Paul Millsap, I do believe that the Nuggets will bring him back. Seems to mesh well with the team, gives them better in presence that they don't necessarily have. Uh, statistically, didn't look like he had a great postseason, but if you look at the numbers um, that Anthony Davis had when guarded by Paul Millsap, they were well below his standards. So uh, I do think in that regard, Paul Millsap did hold his ground. Yeah, I guess at the least, Mike Malone could have subbed out Jokic because he's never really in at the end of games on defense because he was just too slow to go over to, you know, switch on to AD at the end. Like maybe if they had someone more athletic on the bench, then they could have put him in that situation instead. But I don't know. I mean, ultimately, they still lost three other games, so it probably wouldn't have mattered that much. Uh, but now we got a finals preview of the LA Lakers and the Miami Heat, which, I mean, Stephen A did predict, I believe, about nine months ago. But who do you think wins this series and in how many games? And what do you think the series is going to be like? Yeah, so um, it's funny. On first take, you're right. Stephen A. Smith did say his number one Christmas wish is a Miami-LA Finals for the social life. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be in Orlando um, in the bubble. bubble, but he did get that right. Um, I think my heart's telling me Lakers in six, but – We've counted the, the heat out every single series, so I don't want to do that. Um, what I'm really interested in is to see what different kind of schemes Spolstra throws out. Uh, is he going to run a lot of zone? Is he going to run that 2-3? Is he going to alter that zone at all? Um, he's got four guys that can switch onto both AD and LeBron. He's got Iggy, he's got Bam, Butler, and Crowder. My, my prediction still is that the Lakers go small more often. Uh, that most of the 48 minutes are split between AD and Markeith Morris. And if that's the case, then um, then, I, then I predict that Jay Crowder starts on LeBron and Bam on, um, that Bam will get the start on AD. Jimmy Butler will probably guard uh, Danny Green or so and just kind of play that free safety role if they don't go zone. Um, I don't think that they necessarily need to switch all the pick and rolls. Uh, obviously switch the, the AD LeBron pick and rolls, but outside of that, go under and force them to shoot. Um, I do expect the Lakers to try to get Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero, and Goran Dragic involved in the pick and roll to try to get a switch so that LeBron uh, is able to, to go at them. But Outside of that, like I think it's just going to be a great chess match. Two great defensive coaches, uh, one of the best players of all time in LeBron James, trying to trying to outmatch the scheme that Eric Spolstra has for him. Because you know that Spolstra and Pat Riley are in their office trying drawing up a hell of a game plan right now. Yeah, and I think that I expect the Lakers to win this in six. I'm not going to count out the Heat, though. Uh, but I will say this, and I tweeted something out, and I, I'm, I think you saw the tweet, but... I will say this, that the last two times that LeBron James has shot 40% or less from the field in a playoff series was both in 2015 against the Warriors in the finals and our Bulls in the second round. Well, the, the main defenders on him in those series, Andre Iguodala and Jimmy Butler, and both of them play on the Heat right now. So they have guys that can guard LeBron and at least, you know, he's going to get his numbers. Like, that's just going to happen. But if you can make him less efficient in doing so, then that's a huge plus. And, yeah, they could go zone. I know they've gone zone against the Bucks and the Celtics. But usually if you go zone, I mean, that kind of hurts your rebounding. And if they do go big and they're playing in a zone, then you got AD, you've got Dwight Howard, JaVale McGee, all those guys, Marquise Morris, can get in there for rebounds. LeBron's a good rebounder for a small forward. So – that could hurt them in itself. But overall, I think if the Lakers win the series, um, I think Anthony Davis is going to have to play like the finals MVP. And I think he's more than capable of doing so. He's played like the uh, the best player at certain points earlier in this playoffs against Houston, against Portland, uh, a few of the games against the Nuggets. So it's very possible. But I think that's what it's going to take in order for them to, you know, win this series. Yeah, as as the Heat, they're not they're going to do everything in their power to not let LeBron beat them, um, and so that obviously falls first and foremost to AD and past AD to everybody else. Um, but yeah, it's 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 going to be one of those things where um, Iguodala isn't the same Iguodala, um, so he's not necessarily going to. Um, 
he's not physically the same, but I still do expect him to use his his IQ and whatnot to to hold LeBron at least constant. Um, but they just have multiple bodies that they can throw at LeBron, and I think that that's what's going to suit them best. Right, and I'm not saying like because they have these two guys that it's a shoe in. LeBron's going to shoot under forty percent from the field. Like that's probably not going to happen. But if they can keep him around maybe 44, 45% from the field, like that's already a plus because this is a dude that's shooting like 55% in the playoffs. Um, and especially if the Heat shooters are hitting, Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero, then Drogic, then that's even better. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's going to be definitely a grit and grind type of series. And I think um, that the Heat are the least talented offense that the Lakers have faced, or that the Lakers will face. Um, but what they possess that other teams don't is just a ton of ball movement. Um, if you look at the first series, the Blazers, it was just don't let Dame or CJ beat us. If you look at the Rockets, don't let Russ beat us. If you look at the Nuggets, don't let the Jokic-Murray pick and roll beat us. Now... They're more so worried about the off-ball movement. There's going to be somebody that's chasing Duncan Robinson around the court. Goran Dragic is super crafty. Butler can still get his. If they decide to go big and start um, Howard and or McGee, they have to chase Bam around. They have to because Bam is the point forward, so they got to come out to the perimeter. Um, so I think in that respect, um, the Heat's offense is just a lot more tiring to guard because you're not solely focused on one person as you are focused on the whole team. And I think that's what makes it, that what makes it difficult. I've seen people say that this heat team right now is what people expected from the Clippers. Um, Cause they have a ton of guys. And I mean, when we came into the year, we didn't expect the Clippers. We didn't think the Clippers were going to maybe beat the Lakers because of their duo, because I think a lot of us thought LeBron and AD were better than Kawhi and Paul George together. But the reason they would have won would have been because of, like, Lou Williams and Montrezl Harrell and, um, you know, Shamit and all these other guys off the bench. But, you know, the Heat, they have a ton of guys. I mean, yeah, the Lakers have the top two players in the series, but you could argue the Heat have the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh best player in the series. So, and arguably a coaching advantage. So, we'll see how it goes. I think that they definitely got a shot. I'm not going to count them out, but... I mean, having LeBron and AD on your team, I think that that's probably going to be able to do it, and they should win this series in six. Yep, that, that is my prediction as well, um, but certainly cannot wait to watch it. Yeah, and I think that's going to do it for us on this episode. Um, anything le- to say at the end, Johnny? No, nothing, uh, nothing too stark, but just thank you all for the support following along with us, um, and we will certainly break down the finals along the way or if not along the way we'll break them down at the end to kind of recap yeah and that might be the season finale um i mean it'll be like the end of this season so stay tuned for the next episode and we'll see you guys then but we're out peace peace